Go ahead and pop that up. Start with intros and get started. I'm sure people will trickle in as we're talking, but um, so first, I, it sounds like Alex has introduced herself to many of you. Um, so Alex Solomon is our new communication and outreach coordinator. Um, as she mentioned, she's been on staff for about two weeks and we are thrilled to have her. She will be a face that you start to see more often as, um, as we navigate uh, the variety of events that we have lined up over the next couple months. So I would encourage each of you from the community to check out the calendars, um, the preserve calendar for upcoming events. I think we've got one talk every month and then we've got a couple of field events that are um, uh, open to members. For those of you who might not be part of the preserve community, you are always welcome to join us for Zoom talks. So if you saw something advertised in one of our emails, be sure to let us know if you need a Zoom link because that's the one of the beauties of uh, everything going virtual is that it's really democratized access to the topics. Um, so coyotes are our topic for this evening and it's a, it's a topic that comes up frequently. I would say that coyotes are one of the most visible uh, megafauna on the preserve and they are both beloved and also um, cursed, I suppose would be a semi nice way of saying, um, they're not always appreciated. I think there's a lot of mythology that surrounds how dangerous coyotes are and all the terribleness that they can bring, but they are an incredible species that has opened the lens for biologists into some of the real wonders of um, natural systems and the balance of predator-prey relationships, as well as natural systems to compensate for unexpectedness. Um, so, and Carolyn may mention it, but we've talked about it before in our previous conversations with all of you, that uh, coyotes have a compensatory breeding element. So removing one member of their family will actually institute breeding of more animals, um, which is an incredible adaptation and um, is one of those things that we find wondrous, but it also has some very real management elements. So if your first instinct when you've got a problem animal is to remove that animal, there are unintended consequences. And so instead we have really promoted the idea of hazing and of teaching wildlife to be wild and hesitant around humans. And so Carolyn will speak a bit about that um, and some of the, the new research and technologies that are out there, I presume. But um, it's something that we have shared with the community for years and we've done some hazing trainings. Um, hazing's a, it's a, challenging topic because you have to do it right or it can have unintended consequences. Um, but we encourage everyone who's gung-ho to participate uh, to join us in keeping our wild life wild and, um, and teaching them how to be, co how to coexist as we learn to coexist with them. So I know we've had, it was kind of an interesting spring this year where we had several members who had some run-ins very, very early with coyotes, which normally is during the denning season. Um, and so these are, you know, there's always opportunities to learn more about how we can coexist with, with the wildlife that we love on the preserve. So today's speaker is Carolyn Whitesall. Um, she's a human wildlife interactions advisor at the UC Cooperative Extension based in the Bay Area. Her position addresses challenges with species ranging from California ground squirrels to coyotes to mountain lions, all of which we've got on the preserve. She's a PhD in ecology from UC Davis and lived in South Africa for many years where she was working on issues related to cheetahs, lions, and livestock, which is that human wildlife interaction uh, intercept that is very near and dear to my own heart. So with that, I will let Carolyn take it and I appreciate everyone logging in this evening. We also will be recording this and posting it to our YouTube channel because I'm sure there'll be nuggets that you want to revisit or news that you want to share with others. So thank you, Carolyn. Great. Well, thanks so much, Christy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for showing up tonight to learn more about coyotes. And as Christy mentioned, these this is a species that I think uh, arouses quite strong opinions in a lot of people. And you certainly have people that love them and people that hate them. Um, but hopefully by the end of today, you'll have at least a better understanding of coyotes coyote behavior, a better appreciation um, for their ecology, um, and a better understanding to know what is uh, behavior that is completely normal and what is behavior that we may um, try to discourage them from doing. Okay. 
So first off, just a real brief um, overview of coyote identification. So you wanna make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So they're gonna have upright ears and they have a really distinctive long snout. And of course, they're gonna have a long bushy tail and they can come in a surprising number of colors. So I'm not gonna use a color as a you know, distinctive feature because actually they can range all you know, from gray to brown and even red. If we're looking at tracks, it can be really hard to tell the difference between a coyote track and a dog track. For size, coyote tracks are around two and a half inches, whereas dog tracks, as you know, can range quite widely. I find that coyote tracks and um, wild canid species in general, the pads tend to look a little bit tighter together and the foot is tighter, whereas dogs often will splay more. But in general, if we see a track on the ground and we aren't sure if it's a coyote or a dog, one of the things you might wanna look at to help differentiate is how the track is moving. So coyotes, when they're moving, are gonna be going in a straight line most of the time. They know where they wanna go. Whereas often dogs that are off leash, they're gonna be kind of meandering around, sniffing. And so it's not gonna have that same purposeful movement going forward. For coyote scat, it's gonna be very diet dependent. So it really ranges depending upon what they're eating. So it's going to vary in size as well. But typically it's gonna be tubular, twisted, and with a tapered end. And that tapered end is what often differentiates it from domestic dog. It can be pretty soft. Um, and sometimes you'll even be able to see what it is that the coyote has been eating. And that can be one of the most helpful ways to identify it. You know, looking for hair, looking for berries, looking for nuts or seeds from fruits they may have been eating. And it may fold in on itself when the coyotes consume dog food, because that's gonna cause it to be softer so it'll often fold. Whereas domestic dog scat typically looks more consistent and that's because most dogs are on commercial dog food. So it's gonna be you know, more consistent across individuals. And often they will have much more blunt ends to the scat than will coyote scat. Now when coyotes move, they're typically gonna carry their tail downwards, whereas dogs often carry their tail up in the air. And often a dog's chest is gonna appear deeper than a coyote's, which gives the impression that a coyote has longer legs than a dog. So coyotes look very leggy when you see them. Now, another species that often gets misidentified as a coyote is the gray fox. Now, these are much smaller than coyotes. They're, you know, if it's a big coyote, these guys will be less than half the size. They do have a distinctive black tail tip and they typically are this you know, color gray, black line going down their tail and then the distinctive black tip. They look a little bit more cat-like in appearance when you look at their face, like the one shown here. And fun fact is gray foxes can actually climb trees. So if you see a canid in a tree, um, you know it's gonna be a gray fox and not a coyote. Now I wanna to touch upon coyote social organization and behavior because they are really fascinating. And there's a lot of interspecific variation. So what I mean by that is there's a lot of variation even among coyotes in terms of how they're gonna organize themselves and how they're gonna behave. Now I often hear people say, oh, the coyotes are a problem in my area. Like they've even formed packs and that isn't normal. But actually, Coyotes often will live in packs and that is a completely normal behavior. So coyotes either can be solitary or they can live in residential groups or packs. And they can often or also be solitary either resident in an area or you can see a solitary coyote moving through as a transient. My arrow doesn't seem to wanna work, here we go. <laughs> Now coyotes also make really interesting vocalizations. And another thing I often hear people mention is that, oh, at night I hear so many coyotes, like I must be inundated with them. There are so many. And if we listen, so you might not wanna have your volume too high, um, depending on how loud this is. But you can hear there, this is what coyotes sound like. And there's a huge range of different sounds that an individual can make. So people often mistake 
that there are many different coyotes, when in fact, it's just a few. Pausing. See, that's getting my dog to run over out of curiosity. <laughs> But so because the coyotes can make such a range of different noises at the same time as they're communicating, it, it, it is often sounding like they're a lot more than they actually are. And that's how they're able to communicate with each other. So there's nothing wrong about hearing coyotes, you know, at night. I personally find it fascinating. I love hearing them. It's such an interesting noise, um, but that is completely normal. They're just trying to talk to each other and talk to members of their pack, um, communicate with other individuals in the area. Now, if we look closer at the pack structure, it's typically gonna be composed of an alpha pair. So we have a male and a female that are not closely related. And they're gonna be the main breeding pair. The rest of the pack members are generally going to be related to each other. So the coyotes that are born into the pack have a few choices. They can either stay as an associate with the pack. So if there's sufficient resources available, they may be able to stay or choose to stay. They can also leave to become another local, so maybe a local solitary individual. They can be a solitary nomad. So these are individuals that you know, continue ranging and don't really settle down and have a distinctive territory. Or they can completely disperse from the area, find another mate, and start their own pack someplace else. Now for the transients or nomads, um, and here on the right, we can see some home ranges of some um, coyotes that a colleague has collared. These individuals, they can replace residents that have been killed or removed, or they can establish new territories with another nomad. But occasionally, older residents will leave their own pack and become nomads themselves. Overall, pack size is generally going to be affected by food abundance, so how much food is available in the area, by mortality rates, so how often are individuals in the area getting removed, and lots of different natural and human-caused um, reasons for coyote mortality certainly in terms of natural competition, mountain lions, which you guys will have, um, will go after coyotes. Roadkill is a huge problem with coyotes. A lot get hit by cars. Um, and of course, you know, other ways that they get removed. And the pack size will also be affected by the population density. So within a particular area, there's going to be um, a given carrying capacity is the term we ecologists use. So What's the, you know, that will describe the number of individual coyotes that the area can sustain. And that's gonna be able to self-regulate. So if there get to be too many coyotes in the area, then the, then the region can sustain given its resources, coyotes are going to disperse and leave. Whereas if you have an area that has abundant resources, the coyotes will be able to stay and more will be able to move in because that region can handle having more coyotes. In terms of reproduction, coyotes, interestingly, can mate for life. And that's pretty cool. So often we'll have these pairs that are going to remain together until one uh, individual in the pair dies. And at that point, then um, the, survive, the one that has survived will find a new mate. They're gonna raise pups together in the pack and the non-breeding individuals will actually help raise the puppies. Breeding starts in January and February and gestation is 63 days. So pups born between late March to May. And really during this denning season, that's when we get um, the most calls about issues with coyotes. Because at this time, the coyotes, you know, are staying closer to the den to care for the pups. So they're gonna be much more protective of that area. And so if you happen to have a den that's right next to a trail or next to, you know, a popular road where there are a lot of people walking on it, that's where we typically have um, the most issues because the coyotes are just trying to protect their den. And also they're trying to feed the pups. Um, so definitely the time to be careful um, with your pets and livestock, which I'll be touching upon many times in the talk today. Juveniles are going to generally disperse at around six to eight months, and they can either disperse in groups, so litter mates can disperse together, or they'll disperse as individuals. And the distance that they're going to disperse, 
it's going to be dependent on local resources. Start this video. Now a really common myth about coyotes is that they're nocturnal. In fact, coyotes are not. Coyotes are diurnal. If you go to a US national park like Yellowstone, you'll see the coyotes behaving just as coyotes should um, without being impacted by people and they're gonna be out hunting during the day. Now, they have been shown, and as I'm sure you've seen yourself in your own, own encounters with coyotes, there's an increase in nocturnal activity with an increase in development or with human activity. So often coyotes that are living you know, in suburbs or residential areas or in you know, very low density areas, but where they're persecuted by the people there, they're going to either become crepuscular where they're more active dawn and dusk, or they're gonna become fully nocturnal. And that's their way of trying to avoid conflict with us. So the coyotes that we typically hear about that you know, people are worried about or that are causing issues are during the day. Some researchers say that increased daytime activity is part of the scale that leads to habituated coyotes and hence conflict. The reason being that if the coyotes are choosing to be active during the day, despite the presence of people, they must, you know, they're clearly more comfortable um, around those people and hence are willing to go back to you know, their natural diurnal activity pattern. But keep in mind that coyotes that are active during the day are also inherently potentially more likely to cause conflicts or to be perceived to cause conflicts solely because they're active during the day and people can see them. So if you aren't able to see your coyote living in the neighborhood because it's only active at night, you're not going to think there's a problem with it, most likely, um, or you won't be worried as much, you know, if you're walking your dog because you never see the coyote that lives right there. But the coyotes that are willing to be, you know, moving around during the day, those are really the ones that we get called about. So as you're aware, coyotes are thriving in urban areas. And there's really been a shift in the, you know, underlying cause for coyote conflict in California. So back decades ago, because you know, coyote numbers had been, um, you know, so many had been lethally removed, really the conflict was centered on livestock depredation. You know, coyotes can cause huge problems for ranchers. They really will go after you know, sheep, goats that are you know, unprotected and calves. Um, and so that's been, you know, historically you think of, oh, coyotes just causing problems for ranchers. Well, over the last few decades, coyotes have been moving more and more back into um, these more residential areas in the suburbs. I mean, I grew up in the Bay Area and when I was a kid 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, um, we never saw coyotes in the neighborhood. But really in the last 10 years, we're starting to see them again. And this past year, we now regularly see them on my street. So no doubt um, they are moving further into these residential areas because they're so adaptable. And so now we have the shift where actually I'm getting more calls from people living in the suburbs about coyotes than I do from ranchers. Um, we, there's been extensive research, um, still more to go, but we do have some ideas for um, solutions that we can offer ranchers to protect their livestock. And that research is of course ongoing and that's something I'm um, further developing in this position. Um, but it only recently has really been this focus of how do we live peacefully with these suburban coyotes. And the reason that coyotes are able to do so well in these urban areas is because they're habitat generalists. So they have a really broad geographic range. Uh, they're of course native to North America and they've adapted really well to human development. They are very smart and very adaptable. They also have very flexible space requirements. So their home range can vary widely depending upon the resources available. And I mean, my colleague, Dr. Neve Quinn, and I'll be presenting on some of her research, but she has one collar, uh, coyote that's collared down in Southern California, and the home range is a half square mile, and that's it. Whereas if you get to some of these more open spaces um, in other parts of the countries, it's many square miles. So it's really 
really unbelievable and a testament to how well coyotes have figured out how to live in these urban areas. And they're an opportunistic predator and scavenger, which also makes it easier. They're able to switch between food sources to see whatever is available. So in terms of land use, where do we get coyotes? Um, they're going to be setting up shop, moving into any place where they have access to dens for raising their pups, where they have sufficient food available to them, and where there isn't too high of coyote density, so that they already have some space that they can move into. Um, you know, if the area reaches carrying capacity, as I said, carrying capacity of coyotes, um, you aren't going to get any more immigration into that area. But really coyotes, I mean, you'll see them on roads, right of ways, living in river channels, greenways, parks, you name it. Um, and certainly where you guys are is prime coyote habitat. So I wanna delve further into coyote diet because this is really you know, the underlying reason behind most conflicts that we get with coyotes. So there are, as I'm sure we know, a lot of attractants in an urban area. You know, we think of infrastructure. So there we have artificial dens. They no longer, you know, need to rely on, you know, places where raccoons have hollowed something out or dug or where they need to dig. They can use these lovely pipes as den sites. Um, lots of access to trash in urban areas. Fruit trees, tons of fruit trees in California. Uh, coyotes enjoy them just as much as we do. And any rotten fruit that's fallen to the ground is great for coyotes. Bird feeders, um, even hummingbird feeders. People often forget that coyotes will absolutely drink sugar water. I'm sure it tastes delicious. Um, you know, unfortunately, small pets are gonna be an attractant. Um, so even where you guys are, even though it is you know, more open space, pets are gonna be an attractant, no doubt. Um, as well as any pet food and water that's left out. So, you know, bird fountains or water you leave out for your dog, um, you know, water or food you put out for your dog or outside cat. And another aspect, um, and I am assuming there are no feral cat colonies um, near Santa Lucia Conservancy, but I do want to mention it because, um, you know, there are kind of feral cats all over. Um, the negative impacts that research has shown from cat feeding stations and free roaming cats. Um, you know, not only are they a threat to native wildlife and, you know, songbirds, um, you know, health effects on the cats themselves, public health concerns when it comes to, you know, diseases um, that can affect humans. But another aspect is that they absolutely can attract wildlife. So when we have this artificial food being put out, coyotes are going to enjoy eating it just as much as the domestic cats will. Um, and the cats themselves, and I'll be getting further um, into the research on that, will also act as an attractant. So I want to touch upon um, some of the research questions that my colleague, Dr. Neve Quinn, has been looking at. So unfortunately, she couldn't join us today, um, but she's done really fascinating work on coyotes down in Southern California. So I really wanted to share um, some of the findings that she has from her work. So a few of the questions she's been looking at. Um, first, when it comes to coyote diet, is what makes up the diet of urban coyotes in Southern California? Second, what is the relationship between consumption of food types and the characteristics of the surrounding landscape? And then she was looking more closely at TNR colony, which stands for trap neuter release. So these are feral cat colonies and coyote interactions. So to what extent do coyotes in Southern California consume cats? Um, and I think that's, you know, very applicable as well to Northern California and where we have feral cat colonies or just outside cats, right? If you are a cat owner, um, how worried do you need to be uh, with coyotes in your neighborhood? If you have an outdoor cat, that is. Um, and lastly, what is the relationship between coyotes and TNR cat colonies, i.e. do TNR programs actually subsidize coyotes? And her study area was down in Southern California. And how they conducted the research is they collected 311 coyote carcasses. So these were coyotes that were roadkill um, or killed because of depredation reasons. Um, for whatever reason, they were able to then get a hold of the carcass. And 245 of them had identifiable meals in their stomach. 
So to conduct the research, um, they looked at the stomach contents visually. Um, oftentimes you are able to see what is in it. And then they also did identification by hair. Um, so inside the stomach contents to be able to identify what the prey items were. So what did they find? So for um, these coyotes, we had you know over 10% of them had commensal rodents within their stomachs. Um, and so these are rodents um, that are living in relationship with people. So Norway rats, roof rats. Um, quite a high number, 15% of these coyotes had cats in their stomach. Um, and over you know, 30% also were found with other human related foods. So these coyotes are being quite heavily um, subsidized um, by food that they're finding in human environment that they wouldn't be getting in a natural system. Overall, when they also compared um, doing genetics analysis on the stomach contents, which provides another way um, to examine what prey items were in the stomach in addition to what you know, was still visible. So a lot of times, right, after the stomach has been digesting prey items, you aren't able to visually see um, any distinguishing features about the prey item and the hair also may not be available, but they're able to do PCR um, and that actually did allow them to pick up on more prey items that otherwise may have been overlooked. So in summary, they found that a high proportion of urban coyotes in Southern California were found to consume anthropogenic items. And that coyotes that ate native and wild mammals are associated with less development, lower building density, and in locations with more natural cover and altered spaces. So I'd imagine Santa Lucia Conservancy, this would be more of what we would find, that the coyotes are you know, mostly eating native and wild mammals. Now coyotes that ate anthropogenic food were found in areas of intensive urban development, high building density, lower vegetation cover, and farther from natural areas. So the coyotes there that are in these much more urban settings were still able to find plenty of food. And because they're so adaptable, they're able to switch um, the diet than other coyotes who, you know, are going after native prey. Um, these city coyotes have figured out how to access food in this area. So, um, Carolyn, I'm going to cut you off right here just because uh, we did say we would have um, quite a long time for questions because I know our members have a ton of questions. Um, so if you don't mind, um, we'd love to open it up. Um, you can either drop questions in the chat and I can, you know, ask them or she can read them, or um, you can just turn on your camera and raise your hand or use the little reactions button with the hand raise um, and then unmute yourself when you get called on. Okay, um, Mike Stone. Yeah, hi, this is Patty. Uh, and we have a golden retriever that I walk out on the road. And um, twice a coyote has walked right across from the other side of the road. I mean, my, my golden retriever is not very well behaved, but he does sit when I um, tell him to, and he hasn't tried, tried it while I was on leash to try to chase the coyote. But he, you know, but the coyote, I mean, it's like less than 10 feet away. I go to one side of the street and, and the coyote just walks across the other side of the street. And, you know, and then when I walk, he, then he just sort of meanders it, but he's very, so I, I don't know what to do about that. And that's happened twice. And then another time the dog was off leash, Mike was playing with them. And, you know, in our driveway playing with a Frisbee and um, he took off. And because he saw a coyote not far, the coyote was faster. Thank goodness, right. you know. So anyway, we just, you know, that's what we're, why we're concerned about them. So I would be very careful with having your dog off leash. Yeah. Uh, and if are. he's not gonna yeah. be under voice control if he sees a coyote. One coyote, he'd probably be fine as a golden retriever, but multiple coyotes, I, I would be concerned. Um, that he could get injured. And, you know, coyotes are very smart. And if they are in a pack, I mean, they, in, on some ranches that have livestock guardian dogs, they figured out 
how they'll have one coyote distract one dog and then the rest uh, of the coyotes will go after the sheep. So like they, they absolutely can figure that out. Um, so as much as I can just, or as you can keep the dog on a leash um, or just really work with him so that if you do call him, yeah, we're, we're, we're working on the voice command. Absolutely. But I mean, should I be concerned when I'm like walking him out on the street on a leash and this coyote just, I mean, the coyote won't stop. And of course, the first time I saw him, my first reaction was to turn and run. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to stay. Right, don't run. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't do I that. Would try to give the coyote some space. So if it's possible, I would cross the street and just and give the coyote that, that wide. I mean, it's uncomfortable to have a coyote walking within 10 feet, you know, 10, 15 feet of you. Right, no, and so I'll be touching upon more of what to do when it comes to hazing or trying to move coyotes off um, because you, you do have a dog that even though it is a bigger one, so it's less likely to you know, be a potential prey item in the coyote's mind, you still want to be careful. I would hate for, you know, something to happen. Yeah. Um, so I think just trying to give the coyote as much space as possible, I would yell at it to try to get it to move off. Um, you know, in my mind, I, I don't want a coyote within 10 feet of me that yeah. is invading my person. Yeah, it doesn't feel comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so I'll be going over some things that you can do to, to move the coyotes off and teach them that they need to be giving you more space than that. Um, okay. And that, you know, if they give you space, then you'll leave them alone. But otherwise, we don't want them getting too comfortable with. Yeah, it, it, it seemed quite comfortable walking. Right. Like and that. they'll get like that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but that's where we can, you know, we have some options of how to encourage them to be a little less comfortable with us, you know, walking by. So I'll, I'll definitely be touching on that because that is a very common concern that people have. Okay, thanks. I think there's other questions in the chat for you. Okay. And then, yeah, that feeds into one of the questions in the chat from Robert Kingsley. Do coyotes hunt in packs like wolves? They sometimes do, or they can hunt in packs. Um, you know, I'd have to, I'm not sure if in the same exact manner as wolves. I'd have to look that up because I know wolves have a very distinctive manner in which um, they do hunt as a pack. I'm not sure. Sure. I mean, I've just heard a lot of anecdotal um, stories about specifically how they figured out how to distract dogs um, and get them away from their owner. And then other members of the pack will go after them and same with sheep. Um, so they certainly will have coordinated attacks in that way, um, you know, working as a team in order to get their prey. Well, uh, you know, our encounters uh, are well documented in the preserve with the uh, packs of coyotes. I have two dogs and we have been uh, confronted uh, a few times by, uh, by, by packs of coyotes. And it is, it is a terrifying experience. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't let my dogs off the leash for that exact reason. And I, I did, um, and my biggest concern is not, like you said, the one-on-one -on -one interaction between a coyote. It's, you know, four-on-one, five-on-one. Uh, or, or that they separate, you know, the dogs, uh, and, and, you know, that, that's sort of a terrifying prospect, but I, I had read about a coyote that was, uh, in the South Lake Tahoe area that would, um, you know, meander down the street and act injured and draw other dogs out, like smaller dogs out. And then, um, would the, the pack would be surrounded and they, they would take, you know, small and mid-sized dogs um, you know, that, uh, were off leash and round, uh, um, round, you know, hanging around. So, yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, yeah, so they're, they're, they're very smart. And, uh, you know, I, I think, and I don't know if you covered this earlier, but my experience has been, um, you know, within two hours of, you know, sunrise and, and an hour of sunset is the time where they seem to be the most, uh, sort of precocious and, um, so I've, I've uh, uh, dampened uh, my, uh, my, or I've, I've centered my walks now, you know, later in the mornings or into the afternoons and, and I stay away from uh, dawn and dusk. I mean, that's absolutely the right move. Um, as much as people are able to do that, that is what I would recommend. Um, and just, you know, during the times and you're going to be more likely to encounter coyotes, just trying to avoid that. 
And yeah, I've heard very similar stories in Tahoe. And I mean, coyotes will also try to play with your dog to get it to move off. Um, and I've had it, I mean, I have you know, my 40 pound dog where they'll he she'll hear coyote howling in the meadow and like want to go and you know, to grab her and put her leash on. Cause there's no doubt she would go and be like, oh, hi, <laughs> like, let's go play. And she's not gonna be able to defend herself. Um, they're very smart. So we just, we have to be careful. And I know it can be hard when we get in a routine of wanting to do like a particular trail at a certain time. Um, but you know, especially this time of year where we do have denning, um, trying to avoid areas where the coyotes are hanging out and most likely it's close to their dens is really going to be the best bet. And then let's take just one more question in the chat before we go back into your talk. Um, I just wanted to split it up a little bit, um, makes it a little more interactive. So um, Paul Cranold's asking, would coyotes be a food source for wolves as they move back into California? That's a good question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wolves right. will go after coyotes. And so will mountain lions. Great. And okay. Uh, as well. <laughs> a nice, simple, clear cut answer. Um, okay, uh, please carry on. Actually, it's interesting because in Yellowstone, they found that uh, wolves have been a big um, population suppressor for mountain lions. So wow. that may be a bigger shift that we experience in California with the return of wolves. That's really interesting. Um, all right, uh, so we'll do a few more questions at the end too. So um, yeah, please carry on with your talk. Sounds good. So yeah, for this study, I really wanted to highlight that in Southern California, um, they found that cats are much more common in coyote diet than have been found elsewhere in the US, which is a really interesting um, shift in the diet. So the California coyotes do, you know, they are behaving differently than a lot of the big studies that are coming out of Chicago on urban coyotes there. And just a quick summary of what they found for um, TNR colony and coyote interactions. You know, as you mentioned, lots of coyotes are eating cats, um, but also coyotes that ate cats tended to be found in highly urbanized areas with high building densities and further from natural areas. And the locations of cat eating coyotes were similar to those where sterilized cats were regularly released and fed. And so one of the overarching um, kind of suggestions of this study, the, the results at least, um, is that potentially these cat colonies are, you know, either supplying, um, you know, coyotes with food at their current densities, or perhaps are allowing coyote densities to be higher because they're providing such a big food source. And that has, you know, cascading impacts on potentially increasing the likelihood of coyote human conflicts, just because we're having uh, more coyotes able to live in these really urbanized areas. So shifting gears a bit to solutions and how can we manage coyotes given what we know? And I can't harp it enough that I, I probably will sound like a, a broken record by the end of the talk today, but it's so important to be proactive in how we're managing coyotes and not being reactive. Um, once we have a coyote that, you know, it's going after human food and has become completely habituated, it can be really hard um, to get them to be respecting people more um, and to prevent these conflicts. And really prevention is key. Um, honestly, by the time that I'm getting calls with, you know, coyotes acting incredibly aggressive or potentially, you know, coyote bite happening, um, you know, that's too late. We really need to have been taking steps much sooner, pretty much as soon as you see a coyote in your area. We need to be proactive about making sure um, that the coyote is behaving in a way um, that is going to be suitable for coexistence with people. And I do just want to comment that while bites are very rare, um, you know, you are much more likely to be bitten by a domestic dog in your neighborhood than you are a coyote. Um, they, they do happen and we can't deny that. Um, and so I think having you know, a reasonable expectation where most of the time, you know, it's, it's incredibly rare that bites happen, but they can. Um, and really bites typically are a result of people feeding coyotes or coyotes getting into trash and 
for whatever reason, um, you know, research is still ongoing for why this is, um, that that level of habituation and that food really then makes coyotes um, act more aggressive. So I encourage everyone to really work together um, to be proactive and make sure that we keep the coyotes um, behaving in a safe way. So our current management strategies for dealing with nuisance animals or preventing nuisance animals are gonna be um, three main options that I'll be going over today. So the first is changing human behavior, um, which is perhaps the hardest to do, um, but there are actions that we can take to try to mitigate um, future problems with coyotes. Second will be physical exclusion. And third, I do just wanna to touch upon lethal control um, and its impacts. Um, I think understanding what happens when lethal control is used it will be really important. So in general management for changing human behavior, um, I wanna go over some habitat modification suggestions as well as food. And I mean, food is really, I think the crux of coyote issues um, is we really need to remove food sources, anthropogenic food sources and other food sources that are attracting coyotes um, you know, to our backyards. So habitat modification, this one can be challenging and a little bit daunting. I'll acknowledge that, um, but it can have some big benefits. So when we talk about removing cover, um, I really wanna focus on your immediate space, let's say around your house, where you're gonna be spending the most time, um, you know, where you may wanna be having your dog go you know, out at night or where the dog's gonna be um, most likely to be you know, <laughs> out of your sight. Or when you first walk out the front door, how do we try to minimize um, a potential conflict with a coyote? So removing cover can be really helpful. And this is because that's reducing areas where coyotes can rest and where they can hide. So if you have, um, like in this photo, all of these ground level shrubs and bushes, I mean, they're beautiful. Don't get me wrong, they look great. The problem is that a coyote can be behind one of these bushes and be two feet from you as you're walking on the sidewalk and you would have no idea. Um, so as much as you can, trying to trim up that shrubbery, you know, a foot off the ground so that, you know, as you're walking, you can see that, oh, there's a coyote there. I need to give it some space um, or, you know, at night so you can turn on a light or have a flashlight and you can see the coyote is there and um, you can check and make sure that it is all clear um, and that it's okay to continue walking. These shrubs or other harborage um, can also be habitat for other mammals that coyotes may feed on. So, you know, if you have that wood pile in your side yard or you know, kind of that debris pile that can happen in a garden, uh, that can be perfect habitat for rodents, um, you know, bunnies, native food that we want the coyotes to be eating, but we don't wanna be encouraging coyotes to be right in our yard. And perhaps the biggest thing, and this is what, you know, my career has been mostly focused on is protecting pets. Um, whether it's from coyotes or you guys, you know, should also be cognizant of mountain lions in your area. So big thing, keep cats indoors. Um, I know some people love having, you know, letting their cat outside, but really anytime your cat is outside, regardless of the time of day, they're going to be at risk um, of getting attacked by coyotes. Um, beware of having dogs off leash. Um, so I'm not sure what if you guys, what the leash rules are in the conservancy, um, but just in general, whenever you're going to open space, for example, myself, um, if I'm you know, out in open space, dogs are allowed off leash and I have really good visibility, if it's good habitat, sometimes I'll take my chances. But if it's fairly thick, there's a lot of shrubs, I'm not gonna be able to see you know, and check to see if there are coyotes around, or if I know coyotes hang out in this area, I will always keep my dog on a six foot leash. Um, it's just, you, you need to be careful, even if it's a big dog, you don't want your you know, even big dog getting injured by a coyote. And certainly a small dog, be very careful. Um, and it sounds like there are lots of coyotes in your area. I would always keep your small dogs on leash. Um, even at night when you're taking them out to go to the bathroom, I would certainly, you know, look around. I do that, you know, whenever I'm up in Tahoe and I'm letting my dog out, I have a flashlight or I have an outdoor light um, and look, double check that you're not just walking into a coyote, you know, hanging out right there. Um, be careful. If you have any livestock, you know, including chickens, 
really gold standard is going to be enclosing them fully in a pen at night. If you want to protect against mountain lions as well, this enclosure will need a secure roof. Um, and chickens, be careful. <laughs> um, interestingly, just in the last two weeks, I've had two neighbors down the street lose chickens to coyotes in the middle of the night. And it's the you know, story you hear all the time where the people are like, but I've never had a problem and I've had chickens for 10 years. Don't wait until you have a problem and you lose animals. Pretty much all over California, there's the potential for coyotes to be there. So if you have animals like chickens, go ahead now and take precautions instead of regretting that you didn't take action sooner um, and keep those animals safe. Now, as I mentioned, um, you know, coyotes are, can be active during the day. So enclosing animals um, at night will full 100% protect them. Um, and that's where, you know, if your chickens can be in full enclosure 24 hours a day, that's great. Um, I realize that's not always the case given kind of size constraints. Um, there are some other options that I'd be happy to discuss um, further, especially if we have animals like sheep and goats, um, you know, electronet fencing, having guard animals, um, given your guys' a location, um, pros and cons to those, or if they're even feasible. So happy to chat um, deeper into those subjects if anyone is interested. Biggest thing, removal of food sources. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the availability of anthropogenic food has been implicated in most of the occurrences of major conflicts. And by major conflicts, I mean bites. Uh, but really we need more data on why this is the case. Um, but in the meanwhile, we're really just encouraging people to try to, you know, remove, reduce supplemental food sources as much as possible. Um, so of course, you know, feed pets inside or remove uneaten pet food, lids on trash cans. Um, compost is a common one that people um, don't realize that coyotes can you know, eat. Um, so try to limit your access to compost. And given where you are in the conservancy, we want coyotes there, right? They're a really important part of the ecosystem there is plenty for, of na na natural food for them to eat. We don't wanna be encouraging them to be looking for food and getting food at your house or your yard. Uh, fencing is an available option, um, but remember <laughs> coyotes can easily jump or scale a six foot fence or wall. So don't think that your yard is safe because you have a six foot fence. Um, people often get lulled into that false sense of security. Coyotes can also dig. Uh, actually, they're, it's more common to find them digging than scaling a fence. They are, are great diggers. And so what this means is if you do want to build a coyote proof fence, um, you know, you can use electric fencing where all the wires are electrified. Um, some evidence suggests that just having a trip wire at the base of a fence can also um, discourage coyotes from jumping the fence. Um, coyote rollers, which I'll show on the next slide as well, um, having a much taller fence and one that angles. But of course, given HOA restrictions or city ordinances, um, it may not be possible. Um, also, depending upon the size of the area you would fence, it may not be realistic. But for smaller areas um, or smaller yards, there is this product called the coyote roller shown here and how it works is that it prevents the coyote when it's a sufficiently tall fence where they would need to um, grab with their front legs and pull themselves over. It prevents them from being able to do that because once they you know, touch it, they just slide backwards. So it prevents them from scaling the fence. Um, people often talk about using repellents. The research results are mixed on this. Um, Motion activated lights, if nothing else, help give you a sense of if there's an animal in your yard. So I'm a big fan of motion activated lights. You know, if the lights are on, you should be aware maybe you don't wanna um, take your dog outside then. Um, people have tried motion activated sprinklers. Um, you know, again, mixed results often, you know, any of these, the coyotes eventually you know, will often become habituated to them. Um, and same with motion activated noise makers. And really with any of these um, kind of repellents, you wanna vary it as much as possible so the coyotes don't get used to it. Um, hazing. So this is a very common um, technique that people are using. 
I do have to say um, that the research is still out on the effectiveness of hazing. And this is something that my um, colleague, uh, Neve Quinn, is looking at. And I'll be going over um, that project. So stay tuned. Hopefully in a year or two, we'll have some really great data um, looking at how effective is hazing in these more suburban environments. But the idea behind hazing is that we want to tie an unwanted behavior with a negative response. So if the coyote is, you know, 100 yards off doing its own thing, minding its own business, and you're walking plenty far from it, don't haze that animal, right? It's, it's respecting your distance. It's not doing anything um, that's aggressive. I would leave that alone. However, if the coyote is doing something that we don't want it to do, that's where we want to haze. Or if it's in your yard, we want to haze it. We don't want them getting used to being able to, you know, hang out right next to people. I mean, I'll, I've had people send me photos where a coyote is curled up on their lawn chair that is next to the porch uh, sliding glass door. We don't want that. That coyote is too comfortable in this person's yard. You may think it's cute, and I mean, I thought it was cute, but we don't want it behaving that way. Um, and we're really setting up the coyote for problems down the road if we allow that behavior. So it's on us. We need to be scaring that coyote off. That is not acceptable. Um, you don't want it, you know, going to your neighbor's place and doing that if they have, you know, a five pound papillon, right? So it's not fair to your neighbors if you are allowing or encouraging um, that kind of behavior. So for hazing, it has been done with black bears and you guys may have heard about that. Um, they have tried it in Tahoe. And that's had mixed success. A really key takeaway from the bears is that reactive management was much less successful. So once the bears had become very habituated and you know are walking into grocery stores, breaking into homes, at that point, no amount of hazing was changing that bear's behavior. Um, but if they were hazing early on, you know, when the bears first started showing up in suburbs or first trying to get into trash cans, then they did have some success. And so I think that's a really key takeaway here is we need, you know, for hazing to be most effective, it needs to be started really soon after we have a coyote doing anything that is unwanted. And we can't let it get to a point, um, you know, kind of point of no return in terms of behavior. So for coyotes, um, you know, Scientifically, can't for sure um, give any you know, significant values for its efficacy. I will say personally, anecdotally, um, from people I've worked with, again, it's been very mixed results. I did have a community in um, San Mateo County where they, you know, kind of probably similar to what you guys are experiencing where people were walking dogs. It was open space, um, like on a big ranch. People were walking dogs there and having coyotes follow them, you know, getting within 15 feet, you know, people weren't sure what to do. Um, they then did as a community really come together and start, you know, doing the whole, you know, air horns because um, th that area was really big open space. So I think they're even um, shooting blanks and they were able to get the coyotes to completely shift behavior and they stopped having problems. So, I mean, that was a huge success story. Um, they were able to, you know, they felt safe walking the dogs again. Um, I've had other communities where the coyotes have been a lot more brazen um, and they aren't finding um, hazing to be quite as effective as they were hoping. Um, but again, that may change with time if the community keeps at it. So what can you do for hazing? Um, some of the common techniques and things that I suggest if you are, you know, concerned when you're taking walks carrying an air horn with you um, or anything that makes really loud noise. So if you want to buy an air horn, you can just um, have it get an empty can and fill it with pebbles and coins and put tape over the opening and then you can shake it. Something that's really loud that'll often get the coyotes to be like, okay, <laughs> like I'm, I'll turn around and leave you like this isn't comfortable for me. Um, walking with a hiking stick, you know, worst case scenario, if a coyote gets really close, um, you have something to defend yourself. If a coyote is approaching you and you're yelling and it's not responding, it's getting too close for your comfort. Um, if there are rocks nearby um, that you can easily grab, you can try throwing rocks. Um, if it's in your yard and you know you need to get it out of there and yelling doesn't work, um, if you can easily spray it with a hose, that'll often, they don't like that. 
that'll get them to leave. Um, I would really suggest making sure they're not getting into people's yards. Um, that is a behavior that we, we don't wanna be encouraging. And I'll mention on that, if they are in your yard, think through, do I have anything that is attracting them that I maybe haven't thought about? So do that personal kind of checklist um, of, okay, do I have any pet food out here? You know, do I have you know, a, a dog water bowl or a drink or a fountain or a bird seed? Um, is there something that I can then be removing? Um, and that coyote then will probably be like, oh, there's nothing here for me. I'm gonna go, you know, back to somewhere where there is food available. Um, so this is the project that Neve is doing for is, is urban coyote hazing an effective management strategy for urban coyotes? Um, they just started in this past year. So they've been capturing coyotes and fitting them with GPS collars. And then they're gonna be having um, volunteers going out and hazing these coyotes. And they'll be able to see, you know, do they pick up a change in behavior? But some, uh, so you can, Here's some of the, sorry, some of the uh, data they have so far. It's been really interesting. The range of home ranges, as I mentioned, just so variable um, in terms of the uh, distance of their home or the territory size. But some questions that they're looking at, and I would encourage you also to think about um, as a community, is if we haze coyotes, will they, you know, use sites that they're not welcome at? So are we going to get the positive result that we're going for. But then also, you know, given how they're moving, are we going to be incidentally increasing their range and potentially increasing the potential for conflict if they're hazed, right? If we're moving coyotes off, they have to go somewhere. And what are the consequences of hazing coyotes that regularly we use open space? Um, and just keep in mind that whenever we are hazing a coyote, we are pushing them somewhere else, which is why I would be careful, whereas if they're behaving in a way that is non-threatening, that is a behavior we want them to continue to do, we don't wanna punish them for that. Um, we want them to be using these you know, open spaces. We want them at the conservancy. We just don't want them getting too close to people or acting aggressive. So it's really that, that behavior that we wanna stop um, we don't want to move them off of the conservancy. And then I do want to touch upon lethal removal of coyotes. Um, I get asked about this a lot. Um, you know, what if I just get rid of them? So keep in mind that coyote trapping should never be used as a management tool to reduce coyote populations. The only aim of lethal removal should be behavior modification. And what I mean by this is we don't want to, you know, reduce the numbers. The, the numbers of coyotes isn't what causes the problem. Um, it's the behavior of individuals that can cause an issue. And if we, you know, just blanket lethally remove coyotes, we'll probably make our problem worse. If you aren't, if you have a, you know, animal that is individual animal um, that is acting incredibly aggressive, let's say has bit someone, um, then the idea is if you lethally remove that individual, then you're getting, you're solving the problem. The other coyotes aren't causing the problem. Um, if you just blanket go out and set a trap, you don't know what you're catching. You're then impacting the social structure of the surrounding of the coyotes living in that territory. Um, all of these other impacts you're potentially gonna have immigration of new individuals who may be behaving worse than the individual um, you removed. And that's a big thing. I, I was just chatting uh, recently actually with a rancher in Santa Clara County who has cattle. And he was saying how it, he loves the coyotes on his property because they never go after his calves. And that's often you know an issue, right? Coyotes and calves, but these coyotes like they're great, this family, They'll eat the afterbirths of the um, when the calves are born, but they've never once gone after the calves. And he had a neighbor who was like, "Oh, like I'll just shoot them. Like don't worry about it." He's like, "No, please don't. I want these coyotes. If you remove this family of coyotes, the new ones that arrive are much more likely to go after calves. So keep that in mind. 
coyote, like we want the good behaving coyotes. You want to keep them on your property, right? Because it's a whole unknown if you are move individuals, because you're inevitably going to have new ones move in. Um, so you aren't solving the underlying problem. Um, so people like to jump to lethal removal, but if you still have attractants, if you still have all of the things out that caused these, you know, a particular coyote to start acting aggressive, that's just going to happen again to the next one that moves in. Um, you really got to get at the underlying reason why you may be having behaviors that you aren't wanting. Um, and you may have seen this visual where coyote trapping increases coyote populations. And yes, uh, this is true when we, or particularly when we remove large numbers of coyote, of coyotes. Um, but getting into more of like the mathematical models and studies. So when we are removing a lot of coyotes and really depressing the population, it can increase their breeding in years post control. Um, however, it generally does not change density. So number of pups produced and density are um, not necessarily the same, right? You can have a lot more pups, but then they may be dispersing. Um, however, these studies were really based on the removal of many individuals. And that is certainly not what we are looking to do or what we should be doing um, in California. We are not trying to suppress um, the population of coyotes and that won't be helpful um, for the issues people are having. If you're interested in joining kind of the research effort on um, coyote conflicts, uh, my colleague also has put together a online um, coyote reporting system or app called Coyote Cacher. Um, so you're able to go in and record your encounters. Um, and the aim is to try and keep all of the reports in one place so that um, scientists can better analyze you know, what is happening with coyotes in the state um, and try to help improve conflict resolution. Um, so if you're interested in reporting coyote encounters, I would discourage you, you from using Nextdoor or Facebook only um, because that data gets lost and that is really useful data for you know, land managers and researchers. Um, so I'd really encourage you, um, if you're interested in joining the research effort, to go to Coyote Cacher. All right, so that's it for my broad presentation, but more than happy, I'm sure lots of questions, more than happy to answer it. And if in the future you guys have any questions that come up, feel free uh, to email me anytime. Happy to chat. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. That was great. Um, we still have a little bit of time here, so it'd be great if you guys have any more questions, um, or just experiences that you'd like a little bit of insight on, um, now is a great time to ask. Again, you can put it in the chat, you can raise your hand, or you can virtually raise your hand. So whatever works for you, works for us. Anybody? Uh, Robert. Yeah. So um, I've uh, I, I, I carry all the implements uh, with me that uh, you described as uh, potential hazing, um, effective hazing tools such as uh, an air horn. Um, I've got a loud uh, wildlife whistle. Um, none of that has any impact on uh, on the coyotes. They just kind of look at you like you know whatever, dude. Um, How close are they when they don't? They're not phased. Uh, you know, 15, 20 yards. Um, I've thrown rocks at coyotes and I mean, I'm no, uh, you know, Nolan Ryan or anything, but I haven't, and I haven't hit them, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's, they just look up. They, they're not particularly uh, concerned about it. Um, you know, the, and, and typically, you know, we don't have problems, but you know, when we encounter uh, more than one and I, I have two dogs that I always walk, um, and when there's multiple coyotes, uh, they, they tend to demonstrate the, um, what uh, our resident expert describes as the escorting behavior where they, they come at you from multiple directions um, mm -hmm. and not per se aggressively, but you're not sure. And, and you don't know how many there are. You don't know, you don't know where they're coming from. And so, you know, you yell and you retreat and you yell and you retreat 
uh, and um, you know that's that's about the best you can do. I uh, and you know that that has worked. We've uh, not had but you know but, you know one last two years ago during um, I think uh, pupping season or whatever they call it, where they they literally came out of the woods and and were nose to nose with my dogs. Um, and, you know, we just, you know, backed up and, and it was, you know, it's, it's, it's a terrifying thing. And, and, um, you know, I just, you know, I, so far, you know, the experience of, of, you know, keeping them on a leash and walking, you know, not near dawn, not near dusk, uh, has sort of limited the encounters. Um, but, you know, I, I, I just wonder, I don't think they're going to come into our backyard. Um, there's nothing to attract them to do that. Um, is, and it's fenced. Um, but, you know, when you said that they can climb and jump fences, um, you know, that, that causes me concern. <laughs> How big are your dogs? Uh, 85 and 65 pounds. Yeah. Are there a lot? I mean, the odds are slim if you don't have anything attracting them that they're going to end up in your backyard. Um, but given, you know, I'm not sure exactly how the houses are situated, but do you have any outdoor lights at night? No, I mean, a lot of the things that you mentioned are forbidden uh, under our CCNRs here, right? We, we can't have outdoor lights. Okay. Um, you can have motion sensor lights, uh, but okay. we, no, no, uh, no outdoor lights. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I think, I, I don't think it's a food issue. They, they, they have plenty of food here, right? There's, you know, varmints everywhere that they're constantly hunting and digging. And I think that's their preferred uh, food source. I think it's mostly, you know, when we do the encounter, we're just coming upon either, you know, the young or the pregnant or, or, you know, something like that. That's, it, it, it's just, you know, it's, it, but it's a random thing. And, and when it happens, it's terrifying, you know, right. and you just, you just don't know, um, you know, what, you know, how, how many are going to come and, uh, and from what direction. And, and that's, that's sort of the scariest thing. But right. um, in, in talking to Christy, you know, I think, you know, her perception is they really just want you to move off. And, and, you know, so that's kind of what you do. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, that's, that's what we do. So. I mean, you're doing the right thing and I know it can be hard and a little bit frustrating. Um, I mean, with dogs that size, I, if they're on a leash with you, I would, heavily lean towards that. Yeah. They're just escorting you away. Um, they're not coming in to, you know, attack the dogs and view it as a food item. Um, and I think just, you know, doing, keep doing what you're doing in terms of the time of day that you're going on walks. Um, and if there does seem to be a particular, particular trail this time of year, um, that the coyotes are more likely to be seen on than trying to avoid that with your dogs. And I know that's a bummer, right? Cause you want to be able to it's a really great trail. You want to be able to use it. Um, but the coyotes are going to be curious and wanting to know what you're up to and what the dogs are up to. Uh, and so I don't see that behavior having a drastic change. Um, of course, you know, if it is younger individuals that are curious as they mature, then they'll stop. They'll realize they don't need to behave that way. Uh, I'm just curious, do your dogs bark at all or no? Oh, oh yeah. Okay, no, and then I mean, the coyote, what like, my, you know, my, do anything. my dogs are, um, yeah, German shepherds, and they're, so they're, they're, you know, geared for protection. If, right. if they see a, if they see a coyote, then, you know, they're on point, um, and, uh, you know, so they're, and they're not going to back down, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, we, we see them around, you know, they run on the golf course, they, you know, and they, they don't typically come too close to our fence, but I've seen them um, individuals, um, come by and I've gotten some cl pictures pretty close, uh, to, 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 the house, but they're, you know, we're also by a pond. So they're, they're hunting, right. um, dusky footed wood rats, right, Christy? That's, uh, that's, that's what, uh, that's what they like to catch around our pond, but uh, Very fantastic. <laughs> anyways, it's, um, yeah, it's been interesting sort of learning uh, their behaviors and, um, you know, just trying to, properly live in this environment in, uh, in a comfortable way. Right. Cause I mean, the coyotes recognize your dogs as, you know, canids and potential, potential threat, right? They want to 
know what the dogs are up to, especially that size. It's, I think it's going to be more, you know, wanting to keep an eye on them and making sure you're not staying and you're going to be leaving um, versus viewing them as a prey item. If that helps, <laughs> but it's still, you know, just, you've got to be careful and trying to give them as much space and moving off when they're going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, this is all, it's all helpful. And, um, you know, I think our community does a lot of the things right, you know, that, 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 uh, you know, try to keep them wild. So that's, that's a comfort too. I have a question, um, because I am so new here, uh, Christy, do you know, um, what our estimated population is for coyotes? No, I would love to know. We don't have very good population estimates for many of our species. Okay. Um, the population estimates are really challenging for wildlife. Um, and there's uh, a robust debate amongst the biology field on best methods and how to do it. Um, we have seen fluctuations uh, in the populations. Some of it is just frequency in you know, reports of people seeing them, but some of it's also based on our baseline uh, data from our camera transects. Um, and so in boom years after super wet winters, you'll have a lot of rodents in the grasslands. And so our raptors, and our bobcats, and our coyotes will all, their populations seem to increase. Um, so, but there are some hot spots where people seem to have more encounters with coyotes. Um, and the flats is definitely one of them, which is unfortunately right at the geographic and social center of the community. Um, and so it happens where everyone likes to be, including the coyotes. So I want to kind of join in on the comments that like what we have found with the coyotes on the curve is that um, yeah, throwing rocks, making noise is very ineffective in the long run. And the only thing that has worked and it's worked very well in our experience is true all out chasing them hazing and so it's I, I often instruct the members if you're looking to get a good run you gotta wear solid shoes so you're not going to twist an ankle out in the wildlands but if you're gonna if you're gonna haze them you have to do it right otherwise you can actually create more of a habituation where they're like oh that doesn't mean anything like an air horn isn't there's no consequences but if you chase them until they stop looking back they're like oh this is this is real this is and when we've done that a couple of times, the pack will behave uh, differently. So most of the time Try I just- paintball guns? We have um, to mixed effect. Um, typically we never have the paintball gun when we need it. And when we do have it, the coyotes behave themselves. Right, they um, magically figure that out. I mean, we use that for hazing uh, baboons and elephants. In <laughs> so I've been curious with coyotes, cause right, I mean, you guys have enough open space, whereas in more like dense, urban area it's like you can't be shooting a paintball you're gonna hit someone's car or something so that's interesting tried it um today. i've got one of those too <laughs> have you tried it uh no i i every time i carry it i don't encounter coyotes so it's a good deterrent they probably learned they probably see you it works right really in other words yeah absolutely. they're very smart it's like a deer whistle on your car right Carolyn, I had a question. Um, so we're working on re removing rodenticides as a community. And so I was just wondering if you could speak to some of the impacts and, and any of the latest science on rodenticides and coyotes. You know, the jury's still out on negative impacts. Um, certainly in other species, you know, we have, you know, other than acute poisonings, of course, which can happen with coyotes. I imagine you guys aren't um, using as many of the really potent, you know, second generation anticoagulants. I mean, you can't now anyways with the new um, law taking effect. But right, the big question is, you know, it, if coyotes are consuming low levels of first generation anticoagulant rodenticides, is that going to increase the likelihood of getting mange or, you know, other health, uh, negative health impacts? And we don't know. That's um, something that the research community is, is hopefully going to be looking into. It's hard to measure, um, but that's a great question. And there's still a lot of questions around rodenticides in California. Uh, and that's definitely a hot topic, but kudos for moving away from rodenticides. Cause I mean, it can be challenging to move away from them. Um, and I think sometimes people don't recognize the challenges in it and what all that it requires. Great. 
yeah, uh, it's been it's been a, a community wide initiative that's been really making some headway. So it's been awesome. Yeah. And I think oftentimes people don't even realize that what they have may be an acute toxin or second generation. I mean, you can buy that stuff on the internet still. Um, so I've certainly encountered that even with neighbors where I'm like, do you know what this is that you've put out? And they have no idea how toxic it is. So just educating people. We have another question in the chat from Barry Bear. He's asking, um, for the last few months, they've seen what they think are the same two coyotes around their property, hunting and playing together. Um, but they've been scarce the last few weeks and they haven't seen them at all for a week or so. Previously, they had daily sightings. So they're asking, why is this? And asking if that's breeding, breeding season, if that's why. Yeah, I mean, so they're going to have well, variable home ranges, of course. So I, I'm not sure how large the home ranges are of these particular coyotes, but it's not uncommon to have, you know, coyotes or mountain lions, you know, any carnivore where they'll be in a certain area frequently um, for a given amount of time. And then they move to a different part of their home range. You know, maybe they stopped finding food easily. And so we're going somewhere else or, you know, they will periodically move throughout their home range, you know, making sure there aren't any other intruders and marking their territory. Um, so that's fairly common where you're like, oh, where did they go? And then they'll show back up, you know, in a few weeks or longer. Um, or they've decided there are actually better places for them to be within their home range than that particular area. Um, so I, I hope you enjoyed them while you had them frequenting so much. grasses so they can jump and play that's yeah um did you get any photos Barry because I'd love to see them <laughs> yeah we're always looking for good stuff to to uh share on social media Ooh, okay I'm gonna type my phone number into the chat so if you could text me um some of those or if you want to talk about it um I'm just gonna sign off after this but if you want to call me tomorrow I'd love to Love to talk to you about coyotes. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions, um, a Zoom round of applause for Carolyn. Thank you so much for giving us your evening tonight. Um, oh, thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure. And yeah, Christy, I'd love to stay in touch because I'm always curious what uh, hazing techniques different communities are using and how they're working out because it's so variable. It's nice to have anecdotal suggestions from different regions. Absolutely. And uh, likewise, you know, we think of the preserve as a giant laboratory, um, right, for all kinds of study collaborations. So if you need a field site, let us know. We might be able to work with you. Absolutely. I'll keep you in mind. Thank you. All right. Well, good night, everybody. And thanks for tuning in tonight. And hopefully we'll see you at our next event. Cheers. Good night. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> Thank you.